Good evening. Let me begin on behalf uh, of La Trobe University to acknowledge by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the land on which we meet this evening and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, my name is Nick Bisley and I'm the head of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at La Trobe University um, where I'm also a professor of international relations um, between the hours of about two and four in the morning. Um, on behalf of La Trobe, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening to the seventh Bold Thinking uh, series panel discussion for 2018. This is the penultimate uh, panel discussion for this year, and there'll be one more, uh, sorry, the final one will be held on the 22nd of November, um, and also focuses on Australian politics, um, and in particular, takes it, will be taking a close look at the crisis in the Liberal Party, and so today's discussion will probably feed directly into that final uh, session. Um, Australian politics uh, ha is in an, shall we say, interesting spot. Um, there have been six changes in the office of the Prime Minister in the space of 10 years. Um, Voter loyalties are probably more unpredictable than they have almost ever been. Major parties find it difficult to secure a party, a primary vote with a number that begins with anything more than a three. Um, and some polling shows that young Australians seem more disillusioned with the idea of democracy than at any point in our past. Um, have we entered a new political normal uh, in which the conventions of, of voter loyalty, of um, uh, political parasite, of the, of the Prime Minister is, is business as usual, um, or are we in an unusual spot in which we'll sail out into calmer waters? Um, what is the nature of the body politic today? Um, and we're joined this evening to discuss these big issues um, by an absolutely outstanding panel. We couldn't draw together better people to talk about um, the state of Australian politics than the group we have before you. Um, this evening, Tony Walker, La Trobe University's Vice-Chancellor's Fellow, will facilitate the um, discussion uh, made up of, of a panel discussion uh, made up of Mark Texter, uh, Liberal Party strategist, Labor heavyweight Jeff Walsh, uh, Guardian Australia political editor Catherine Murphy, and Roy Morgan pollster Michelle Levine. Uh, they're here to, as I said, they're here tonight to dissect the business of politics and undertake a warts and all examination of the Australian political system. And if we take that literally, there are many, many warts uh, to, to, to discuss. Um, before we begin, I just need to introduce each of these um, panellists briefly, uh, and then I'll throw to Tony to facilitate the discussion. Uh, Tony Walker, as I said, is a Vice-Chancellor's Fellow, and he's had a long and distinguished career as a journalist. Uh, this has included being a foreign correspondent for Fairfax and the Financial Times of, uh, of London, uh, including postings in Beijing, Cairo and New York. Uh, he returned to Australia to be the political editor for the Australian Financial Review before being posted to Washington as the Finns North American editor. Uh, he now writes fortnightly columns uh, for The Age and Sydney Morning Herald, along with a column for The Conversation. Uh, he's won many, many uh, awards for his journalism, including two Walkleys for commentary and the Paul Lynham Award for Excellence in Press Gallery Journalism. Uh, Jeff Walsh is a La Trobe uh, graduate and in 2016 was awarded the Distinguished Alumni Award from the university uh, and has a long career spanning politics, government, media and business. Um, this has included roles at BHP Billiton, uh, a special advisor to the CEO and Director of Public Affairs at the International Labour Organisation um, and as Australian Consul General to Hong Kong. Uh, Jeff was National Secretary of the ALP between 2000 and 2003 and was a senior advisor uh, to Bob Hawke and Paul Keating when they were Prime Minister. Uh, and served as Chief of Staff to Victorian Premier Steve Brax uh, and the Senior Advisor to Victorian Premier John Brumby. Uh, Mark Tex Texter uh, is a pollster and electrical, electoral strategist and he's helped election victories for seven Commonwealth Prime Ministers over many, many elections. Uh, he's been described by the UK's Channel 4 T uh, as one of the most influential political strategists and pollsters to walk the planet. Um, he's also the co-founder of Australia's only homegrown global research campaigns and communications firm, the Crosby Texter Group, that has over 100 employees across major offices in London, Sydney, Washington, Milan, Dubai, and Canberra. Uh, Michelle Levine is the CEO of Roy Morgan Research, and uh, has over 30 years' experience as a researcher. Uh, Michelle is responsible for thousands of surveys, including many of the largest research projects ever undertaken in Australia. Michelle was instrumental in the development and refinement of Roy Morgan's single source, the world's leading consumer study, and in 2010, the introduction of the Roy Morgan Business Survey. Finally, Catherine Murphy uh, has worked in the Federal Parliamentary Press Gallery since 1996 for Fairfax, News Corp, and Guardian Australia, where she's currently the political editor. She's the host of the podcast, Australian Politics Live, and a regular panelist on ABC's Insiders Program, and a director of the National Press Club. 
uh, in 2008. She also won the Paul Lynham Award for Excellence in Press Gallery Journalism. Uh, and in 2012, she's a Walkley Award finalist for the Best Digital Journalism category. Uh, and finally, she's the author of the recently published book on disruption published by Melbourne University Press. Uh, I will now hand you over to uh, Tony Walker to lead the discussion. Well, welcome, all of you. I have to say, with the lights shining in ours, I can't see to the back of the uh, auditorium, but uh, I think we've got a good, uh, a good turn up, and uh, thanks all for coming. Uh, Nick introduced the panellists, and I'm not going to go into any more detail about them, except to say all of them are friends of mine, uh, those I've had thing, uh, uh, dealings with over, over many, many years. Catherine and I, of course, worked at the Financial Review together. Uh, Mark has provided wise counsel to me over, over many years, uh, as has uh, my friend Jeff Walsh, and Michelle Levine has, of course, uh, been helpful to me uh, interpreting the, the mood of the country on occasions, uh, as has uh, colleague uh, Gary Morgan, I think, who's in the audience. Uh, I did a back of the envelope calculation uh, as I was coming in here on the tram, and I think what you've got seated on the stage here is a collection of individuals who have been associated with Australian politics in way, one way or another for a cumulative total of 200 years. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> feels like it. Um, good Lord. 100% uh, feels like it. Uh, I, I, I think it's probably fair to say that uh, Catherine's uh, the baby of, the, uh, uh, of our group, but uh, I was a bit surprised to hear that she did start in 96. I thought she'd start a little later than that when I arrived in the Financial Review Bureau. She was already there, of course. Um, I'm not sure how many of you went to Mr. Rudd's presentation uh, last night, but uh, uh, I think we should be grateful uh, to Mr. Rudd because he's uh, provided the entree for, for the main course for our discussion uh, this evening. Uh, actually, I should uh, let you into a secret. He, he proposed that he join our panel and uh, we uh, politely declined. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you were only five minutes. Uh, out of uh, concern that uh, all the oxygen might have been sucked out of the room, and we, uh, well, we could have gone home and had an early dinner. Um, uh, not least of our concerns, of course, were we weren't sure what negative references or otherwise might have appeared in his, his, his book, the latest Rudd Tome. Uh, as it turned out, only Mr. Walsh among us is mentioned in dispatches. And uh, I, of course, when I bought the book, I went very quickly to the, to the index uh, and was, I, I'm not sure, relieved or disappointed to find that my name wasn't, wasn't there and wasn't taken in vain. Uh, there were two Murphys uh, mentioned, Catherine, but not you. You'll be pleased to know. I, I will be pleased um, to know. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, Mr. Rudd last night provided a useful segue into our topic uh, for tonight, uh, which the headline is, of course, uh, is democracy broken? I don't think anyone on this stage believes it's actually broken, but I, I'm sure there are view, strong views here about uh, the state of our democracy, good, bad, and indifferent. Um, Mr. Rudd's speech, as those of you who were there would attest, was about democracy and its fragility. As he put it, quote, it's a fragile garden that needs to be tended carefully, and I think we could probably all agree with him. He then proceeded to talk about what he called the five disruptions affecting our democratic system. I thought it wasn't a bad summary. Uh, perhaps leaving aside his obsession with uh, the disruptive uh, Mr. Murdoch, who he referred to as Uncle Rupert uh, more than once. Uh, in short order, Mr. Rudd mentioned the disruption caused by artificial intelligence and its threat to jobs, strains on a social compact because of a widening gap between haves and have-nots, what he called the balkanization of our social discourse, partly due to a proliferation of social media, an erosion of confidence in our institutions like the church, and what he called short-termism in Australian politics, driven partly by the cult of the opinion poll. Now, I'm not sure whether uh, uh, Mark and uh, Michelle would agree with that description, uh, the cult of the opinion poll, but we, we'll, we'll hear about that. Um, uh, he, he also, I should tell you, dwelled at some length on one of his obsessions, as I mentioned, that is, in his view, the perfidiousness of Mr. Murdoch, or Uncle Rupert, as he called it. 
Um, I'm sure these and other issues will arise in our discussions. Uh, at the end of this uh, presentation or Q&A here on the stage, we're going to invite questions from the audience and leave half an hour so there'll be plenty of time for people to ask questions, so perhaps you can uh, think up uh, questions to ask uh, for, that, uh, for that half hour. I'd like to start with Michelle Levine on my, my right here uh, on the issue of trust, which of course the uh, uh, Morgan Polling Organization polls uh, uh, all the time. Uh, and, and, and I ask the question because trust in politicians and institutions is critical to the functioning of our democracy. So Michelle. What do we say about trust in the system? What or do we say about it? trust or lack of it? Um, let me first of all say I think democracy has been disrupted and don't expect calmer waters. Every industry that we look at has been disrupted and if you find one that hasn't, it's about to be. And I don't think there are calmer waters coming for all of us. And what this means is that trust is more important than ever before. When we're all unnerved and uncertain, Trust is absolutely critical. So trust is really the foundation of all human connections. It's the glue, it's from intimate relationships to business relationships. It's the stuff that enables us to get on a plane and know that we're going somewhere. The stuff that enables us to actually use a credit card. All of these basic things rely on trust. But it's distrust that is the most paralyzing thing of all. So we, with distrust, our deepest fears and our sense of betrayal um, really emerge with that sense of feeling foolish to have trusted too much. And I think right at the moment in Australia, we're actually reeling from a series of shocks of betrayal about, you know, feeling that, that our trust has been broken. Whether it's with the, the churches, and last night we heard the sorry. I mean, how much trust and how much betrayal has been involved in that that we're now having to face? Um, things like our banks, and especially the AMP. So there was always a bit of a feeling about the banks that you weren't quite sure what you could trust and what you couldn't, but the AMP, that was like Mother Goose. And we feel this incredible shock and betrayal about the AMP, even sport with cricket, and then with media. You've got things like the, the Facebook Cambridge Analytica thing. So everywhere we look, and I have to say, whenever Roy Morgan seems to go out and start surveying an industry and understanding which companies or which brands people trust and distrust, we seem coincidentally to land in a place where there's distrust exploding. So we really are facing an extraordinary time of distrust. Today, only 16% of people put um, rate, rate politicians as, as being high for honesty and ethics. It's about, until a few days ago, 34% of people rated public opinion pollsters as high for honesty and ethics. You would have to say after the Wentworth election, when the ridiculous polls just got it so wrong, by massive factors, not, you know, 1% would be an embarrassment for a real political opinion pollster. These polls were out by 10%, completely ridiculous. After that, you'd have to say public opinion pollsters would be really distrusted. Mark, would you like to pick up on anything that Michelle said about opinion pollsters being distrusted or lack of trust in, in uh, institutions and politicians? Well, I think there, you've, like most things, there's some, there's some subtleties. I agree with everything. Um, that, that Michelle says, but what we found in having to deal with these issues, so rather than just measure them, generally our clients come, come to us and say, look, we've got this problem called trust or declining vote or whatever, let's deal with it. There's, it it's interesting, there's differentiation. The first is by age. Um, we've been finding for the last five or six years that um, those over 45, 50, their decline in trust in institutions have been driven by the economy. Um, whereas under 35s, their decline in trust of institutions tends to be uh, cultural differences, a, a more transactional approach, a more mercenary approach to consumer voting patterns. And then we find different dimensions to trust. So if you look at, you know, if I could be so, uh, so, so simple as to say, look, you know, I trust my neighbours to, to look after my son, but not my superannuation account. So if you recall in the 2004 election, um, uh, Mark Latham used the issue of trust 
against John Howard and his uh, uh, decision to go into the war in Iraq. And what we did is we said, OK, let's have a look at the elements of trust. And we found a number of elements, and there was about 24 elements to trust. And we said, OK, well, who do you trust to run the economy? And, and on that, uh, our numbers were good for John Howard. So all these things have different l dimensions. The one thing I have noticed, however, um, in respect to, to institutions, trust, and polls is this, is that the, the echo effect of the polls is probably greater than when I started in this caper in 1987. That is to say, the typical response of some in the press gallery, not Murph, of course, is to say, you know, politics is too poll-driven. Um, and then they go, oh, look, a poll, and then report <laughs> it. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing is polls, and Michelle said this publicly on many occasions, polls are not necessarily bad. Probably the most poll-aware politician that I've ever worked with is John Howard. I was his pollster for a decade and a, and a bit, a bit more than that, actually. He was, we polled weekly for him, sometimes bi-weekly, as in the lead up to elections. And, but he didn't follow published polls. He looked at a poll and said, OK, I want to introduce the GST, or I want to you know, reduce the incidence of guns and gun violence in Australia. How do we do this? What do, what do the public think? Um, what are their hesitations and concerns about handing back their guns? If they need some money to buy back their guns, how much would that look like? What do I have to say? What does um, the National Party have to say? What do my colleagues have to say in country areas? And so on that occasion, rather than being evil, um, the polls were able to get through significant reforms. And the, second, the last part, I'll, I'll finish on this, is, th is that polling and politics should help good policy. And it works this way. Rather than following a published poll and then reacting, um, a, a successful politicians that we've worked with, like John Key, uh, David Cameron, John Howard, tend to use poll to increase their capital. And then through that political capital, through strengthening that political capital, they then spend it on reform. GST reform, gun reform, clerk reform. And because they do that, and social or economic conditions improve, then they rebuild their capital. So there is a virtuous, virtuous, virtuous cycle that you can have uh, through polling and the, po and the business of politics. What's happened, however, I think, is that that virtuous cycle has been disrupted mm. by an over-reliance on reactionary public polls and an over-importance of polls. I mean, this term, so-and-so's lost X amount of news polls, what does that mean? It's completely ludicrous, as ludicrous as someone blithely saying the base mm. or the swing. Mark, can I just say it's really, really important. We shouldn't knock these polls completely because polls are actually the voice of the people. And um, even as you're speaking, there's a nuance to this that John Howard may have heard the poll and said, OK, this is the way I get my reform through. I would like to think that our leaders actually do have a view about what needs to happen in Australia and they need to understand what people, everybody's fears are. They need to really listen to those fears and then not just think, OK, so how do I get my idea through? But maybe they should actually stop and listen and think, now that I've heard those concerns, maybe I'm not quite right. That's not being poll driven, that's actually being a leader for everyone in Australia. So what my great fear is, is that these polls are used in the wrong way, some of them are really dumb, but basically they should be our listening post. Um, you know, Roy Morgan, the man who set up our company, said that it was really important to have polls because basically that was the only way that politicians or anyone could know what the people really thought. Without them, you'd have politicians and journalists claiming to speak for the people. But the and polls that was really tell dangerous. Us, the published polls at the moment don't tell us how we think. They tell only tell the media how people are voting. They don't go deep into, Just into how that they Just on question, Catherine. They should. They well, should. No, the critical thing is, and you, you touched on it, not only how are you going to vote or what do you think about an issue, the critical thing is what are your fears? That's what we need to do. Whether we're measuring trust or distrust, it's actually what are your fears? That's when you actually understand the real things that people don't have an opportunity to get out. 
without listening to those fears, we are in really big trouble. We'll have people who are really struggling, really suffering, being unheard, feeling they get a raw deal out of life, and that's not good for anyone. As a practitioner journalist among us, what do you think of those observations about journalism and polls? I'm going to ask Jeff as well a similar question. Oh, I, I think they're entirely valid. Um, uh, and, you know, Mark's sort of counterpoint between there's too many polls and all oh, there's a poll, you know, there's an easy story is, is absolutely right. Um, but it's... It, and there's, there's also the phenomenon of, which was touched on briefly, but of single-seat polls not being very reliable. We've now got a very long, well, you know, quite a, quite a body of evidence that shows that single-seat polls are not very reliable. I mean, some of them are OK, some of them are wildly off. I don't really know why that is. Uh, these guys Look, it's not magical. Can I interrupt? Yeah. It's not magical why they're off. It's because people don't do the surveys properly. If you actually take a single seat and interview a cross-section of people in that single seat in their homes, you will get a really good read. On the other hand, if you do a telephone poll... Yeah, sure. You miss them. Yeah. And if you do a, um, a mobile phone poll, you don't know where they are. If you do an online poll with commercial panels, people promise they're in the seat so they can get paid to do the survey. It's not magic. It's just that a single seat poll brings out the worst in these really bad, cheap polling methods. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't think I thought it was magic, but, uh, but uh, it's, it's about methodology, basically, yeah. and it's about whether it's a robo or whether it's a sit-down poll and all of those sorts of things. Um, now, why are we sort of, why are we, um, I suppose, because you asked me the question, Tony, about as a practitioner, mm -hmm. so why are we, why, obsessed with why are we, well, I mean, the why do we, is well, why, what, what is their utility to us mm -hmm. as practitioners? Well, I think it's partly because we do live in very uh, disrupted, fascinating, slightly scary uh, times. And, uh, you know, the, the essential poll that I report on once a fortnight, which, uh, which is uh, associated with The Guardian, I find quite useful because there's a bunch of questions that are, that are put in that poll week after week uh, that, that give me a little bit of a read on, on uh, all kinds of topics. And what they remind me too, now having reported on this series for as long as I've been political editor, which I think is about two years now, um, you know, it reminds you that humans are contradictory, <laughs> that they think several things at once and, the, and some of the things they think might contradict one another. And so that for me is quite rich information. Um, you know, so that's the sort of upside, I suppose. They're a, they're a, they're a signpost in a, in a cluttered, chaotic sort of world. Um, they're also, it's also just a, a source of continually refreshing content, and I think Tony's going to get into media disruption oh, yeah. with yeah. me, so I won't, I won't burden you with that now. We'll get to that. Yeah. But it's, it's just part... You know, the world is very... out. My world, the, the world I inhabit, is extremely content-hungry more content hungry than it's ever been in the 22 years I've been a journalist. So we are constantly in source or, or in seeking new content and new polls are new content. Yeah. Jeff, next uh, question to you. Let's go to the central question, unless you sure. want to add a word about polls. Since you, you know... Well, I, I just make this, this recollection in the last Morgan poll taken the end of 1982, before Bill Hayden stepped aside for Bob Hawke, Labor's right. primary vote was 48% in that poll. So, you know, pretty extraordinary sort of circumstances. But, and the country has changed so much in that period. The population was 14 million, 40% of people were in unions. Uh, you know, the, the nature of the, 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 the nation has changed so fundamentally that uh, there are just so many different uh, perspectives and regional dimensions to these things, and the polling's uh, a critical way of getting a handle on it. I think the other thing is, at some point during that period, people figured out you could also use the polls to give the government a clip under the ear, and uh, often did so, you know, mid-term and, and uh, when things weren't going well. Let's, let's go to the central question uh, of, of democracy, and, and the broader question is democracy broken. Um, 
are, are the workings of our democracy under stress these days, even fractured? Um, what can be done about it, uh, Jeff? Uh, and perhaps, perhaps you can give us your view on that. Well, I think the top line, or maybe the bottom line, is that uh, the system is certainly under stress. There's no question about that. But look at it in a, a couple of ways. Put it into an international context, and I think Mark's got some, has some interesting points on this as well. Of the 32 OECD countries, uh, recently there were only four of them that had majority governments. Um, you look at uh, the historical perspective for Australia, um, the first 10 years of federation we had eight governments. Uh, that then run into, ran into the, second world, the First World War, the conscription debate. So we've had periods where our politics has been fairly tumultuous and uh, and people have wondered about, uh, you know, how effective it was. And then we had the long liberal Menzies era, and then followed by the Hawke Keating years, which were productive, and the stability of the Howard period. So, you know, in, in lots of ways we go through these cycles, and I think we're obviously in a, a, a difficult period. If you look at the actual machinery of our democracy, it's pretty sound. Uh, the Electoral Commission runs fair, free elections, we've got universal suffrage, Compulsory voting connects the whole community to the political system very quickly, including uh, new arrivals. Um, and there's a high uh, acceptance of the, the outcomes of our uh, electoral process. So we've got a good context in which to conduct uh, our democratic debates. People are free to express opinions. There's nobody jailed for uh, uh, political criticism. Or, or, or be chopped up into little pieces. Well, indeed. Um, so we have a lot to be happy about, a lot to be uh, thankful for, but there's no doubt people feel that the system isn't delivering outcomes that they would like. And if you look at the, you know, the lack of wages growth that particularly affected the, the bottom end of uh, the socioeconomic scale, that has been a, a deep problem. It's also a, a problem through the other uh, uh, OECD economies. And finally, I guess, there's the bigger historical context that we're seeing, you know, perhaps the end of the, the European domination of the global economy, the return to China and India as the central parts of uh, the world economy, and that's obviously having a massive impact on employment, and, uh, industrial and uh, export uh, opportunities. Uh, here and, and around the world, and then ultimately, of course, the strategic issues that are arising in that context as well, which haven't quite reached the public mind, but are starting to, you know, play at, uh, at the edge of the debate. So it's all, you know, a, a complex set of things and uh, under stress, but I think we're, we're still alive and kicking. Mark, do you have a view about the fracturing of our system or otherwise? I, I just uh, on the international perspective, if you look at some of the available international data comparing confidence in the political system, not just trust, because confidence also includes things like competence, the ability of leaders to come up with international, you know, in, in, inventive ideas and new policies. But if you look at that, we sit around mid-tier um, with other, other nations, and including nations like Germany and France. So we're not in a situation yet, although we're in a decline in confidence, where we're extraordinary in any way. And in fact, if you take in some outlier data, we still lie up at the top of the international table in terms of confidence. I absolutely agree with Jeff that our institutions are quite sound and you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If you look at what's been extraordinary or what's, you know, allegedly extraordinary, as the lawyers would say, there's been really two things lately, hasn't there? There's been the change in, changes in Prime Minister. That's obviously something if you go overseas that you'll get confronted with. Um, and of course, you know, some very interesting characters in the Senate. Well, Jeff can attest that there's always been some interesting characters in the Senate. We had to get the GST passed a bloke called <coughs> Brian Harradine, um, who believes in, believes in God's intervention on all things. Uh, but uh, if you look at uh, the, 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 you know, the the elephant in the room, it's the changes in Prime Minister. I mean, that's where I think the system's out of sync, because what, what's happened is we've run increasingly prime ministerial um, election campaigns with Kevin Rudd's being the sort of zenith of that, where it's Kevin 07, almost purely focused on him and not the party brand. 
And when you think about it from a voter's perspective, you voted Kevin Rudd in 2007 and got Julia Gillard. You voted Julia Gillard in 2010 and got Kevin Rudd. You voted Tony Abbott in 2013 and got Malcolm Turnbull. And you voted Malcolm Turnbull in 2016 and got Scott Morrison. Yeah. So there is a particular... Now, while our parliamentary system allows the parliamentarians, Jeff will correct me, the pleasure of electing um, our Prime Minister, two things in parallel have happened. Increasingly um, presidential-style election campaigning with a focus on the brand, and I know from a... From a, a, a somebody who helps construct these things, stop the votes, end the waste, I did that, that those two things are effectively clashing because you've got an increasing focus less of the party brand and more on the leader at a time when the parties haven't really instituted rules to provide stability to the way parliament, parliamentarians elect one. And that is slowly adjusting too because the, if you look at various political parties around the world, a lot of them are adjusting to this by having, it's not in the constitution, but it's certainly a set of rules that provide stability. Um, that is, you know, a certain number of party members who get to, to vote if you were to change a leader in addition to the party members. I think that's in place in, in the UK um, and, and I think in place with the, the Labor Party here in Australia. So with most things in politics, the, the best thing in a closed system is to let the system work it out rather than intervene and change the rules every time there's a change in circumstances. Mm. And is it happening fast enough? Well, we can have that debate. But certainly some systems are adjusting to that. Catherine, uh, the media mm -hmm. and lack of confidence in the system, and you, you, you wrote about this in your, your book, Disruption, and I, I'm not sure if it's for, uh, on sale outside, but if it is, go and buy it. <laughs> Thank you, sign Tony. some copies. Yes. But uh, what responsibility do you think the media has for this problem of short-termism, uh, superficiality, um, uh, writing about politics like it's a horse race, mm. um, not being so concerned about public policy, but who's up and who's down, mm -hmm. which was, of course, what we always, what we did in the press gallery, perhaps too much. Yeah. What do you say to that? Oh, well, uh, I think those concerns are utterly fair and reasonable uh, and, and, and valid. Uh, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's a more complex story than the one people necessarily think is the story, if that makes sense. Um, I think uh, you, can, you can look across the span of political journalism in this country over many years and find many criticisms with it. Uh, but what's happened uh, in my reporting lifetime is a massive technological disruption to the way we do our jobs, which has had very, very profound effects. On, uh, on journalism itself, on the public debate, uh, on politics, and it's also connected to broader trends in our, in our society, in our culture, that, uh, that are sort of sitting behind this general sense of unmooring that we have, that sort of cultural sense of unmooring. So it's sort of, a, it's a bit like the politicians, I sort of say this a bit, um, and, you know, Marx sort of raised the, the revolving door of prime ministers, which is just so pernicious and corrosive to trust in our political system. Um, I say this to people, it's not like that the, a bunch of would-be leadership aspirants, you know, had a secret con conclave off campus, woke up one day and decided just to be shit. That, I can, I can tell you that didn't happen. Uh, and in terms of journalism and the way journalism is, uh, journalism is practiced, it's the same. We didn't have an off-site meeting and determine that we were just going to fail our readers. We didn't do that. But what happened, uh, and I, I know this happened because I was there and I witnessed it and I went through the transition and I'm still living through the transition, is that if you were a print journalist, one set of conditions applied. Uh, there was an orderly cycle of the way that information was processed. There was quite a long lag between when information landed and we communicated with an audience. It seems extraordinary to me now that I could have gone for 12 hours without communicating with an audience. Mm -hmm. That just seems mm. like it happened in another century. Mm. But it really only happened five minutes ago. Mm -hmm. So in the print period, 
the way we processed and shared information was much more orderly. In the digital period, there's been a massive disruption to that. And in the little book I've written, I sort of, I have an, which I, which I won't get into, I hope you do read it, not because I think I'm fantastic, but I think the story I'm telling is really important. Um, you know, it, it's, it's sort of like being a car worker. I have an analogy about being an auto, working on an auto assembly line, and it's like one day you have a certain set of workflows and practices, and the next day, literally with no warning, someone's cleared out the factory, bought in new technology, sat you in the room, put a live audience in front of you, said half of you are gone now because the economics of the industry don't work anymore, just carry on like nothing happened. Faster. Faster. <laughs> That's what happened to us. And we did it in front of you. Now, did we do it well? No. Could anyone have done it well? No. Are we getting better? I hope so. But there are some fundamental dynamics associated with the digital news cycle which are corrosive for public conversation, democracy, and for politics. And, uh, and the only way we can be active citizens in our own democracy is to understand what's happening, why it's happening, and then that helps us to sift out better quality information. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a long conversation which I can't possibly do justice to tonight, but if you can do chase up the little book if you're interested because it's laid out there in some detail. I, I'm going to ask Jeff uh, to comment on that because what Nick didn't mention was that Jeff started in the press gallery. I think we were colleagues in the press, or competitors actually. I worked for The Age then and, and Jeff worked for the, uh, the then The Sun News Pictorial, right? A much better uh, paper in those days. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we dreaded the midnight phone call, I have to say. Laurie Oakes has uh, yet again has scooped us. Um, <laughs> But, you know, what observation would you make, uh, Jeff, having worked at, in that period, then, of course, uh, been an advisor to prime ministers uh, and then been national secretary of the Labor Party? So you've seen uh, this evolution over a broad sweep of our history, uh, obviously. Yeah, and I think I'm glad I'm not in, in the game in these times because working with Bob Hawke and then with Paul Keating and... Uh, Mark's made the point about how John Howard went about his uh, political communication. We actually had a chance to, to make a case, uh, to prosecute an argument, and to do it over a period of time and in a range of forums and, and get the issues out and deal with the, uh, the thorny bits of the direction you wanted to go in and get it right through that process and communicate the, the benefits and the, uh, and the outcomes that were worth uh, persevering now, you turn sky on and before someone's made a speech, there are people on analysing, commenting, criticising, pulling it apart. They don't even get off first base before you're dealing with the, uh, the incoming missile. So I think it makes it very difficult for the politicians to run deep arguments about big policy shifts. Uh, when you can get knocked off course so quickly. I, I, I'm going to ask um, uh, Michelle, she didn't mention before where journalists uh, stand on the pecking order, whether it's above politicians or below. I'm going to ask you that, but I just want to ask Mark, the cable television, the 24-7 uh, news cycle, social media and everything else, is that, is that creating such a sort of hothouse atmosphere, do you think, that it's difficult for rational policy making to be made? And it puts a, an undue pressure on the system. Well, it's been... The trouble is, is either through the entertainment of the West Wing or the crazy entertainment of After Dark Sky, you're effectively monetising a two-speed political economy. And I wrote about this in The Fin. And this is how it works. So you get a simple issue like the NDIS. Uh, in the old days, to, to, to Jeff and to Murph's point, you used to be able to at least touch on some of the basics of that. Who's it for? Who does it affect? How much money will you get? What will be the social effects? You know, some of the political motives, why did they think about this? Who contacted the, the various politicians? Why is there bipartisanship? So there was al there's always been that political element. Um, but I think what happens now is immediately what will happen is because there, there's 
uh, a market. So someone has to appear on the drum or sky or write a column or fill in that hour, because it's now hourly. So there's a monetary disincentive not to write it because you lose, you lose pace with your competitors. So there are people paid to take a simple issue like disability insurance and immediately create a derivative market. They earn money by deriving that issue into politics immediately. Do you understand? So it's a typical of mature markets in that they create derivative markets. So we've got a fast lane. NDIS, bang. What's the politics? Gender bias. What do people think? There's a poll on it. What's the motive? Will Labor agree with it? Bang. You know, everyone's on Sky TV and the drum talking about it. On the, in the slow lane are the voters. And they're sitting there in their car listening to their radio and going, what's the NDIS? <laughs> How much is it worth? <laughs> but what's the politics? What's the wedge theory? What's the National Party going to say? What is the inevitability of a, of a hung parliament on this? Well, hang on, slow, slow down, the pundit's saying. Well, can I find out just, like, what's in it? And case in point, do you remember when um, the Gonski reforms were first announced? And I, wa I wasn't involved in that reform. I was, I was there speaking to some of the Labor Party fellows in the early days of the NDIS. But on that one, no, because we had a different position. Um, but I remember doing a, a survey two weeks after Gonski was, the first round of Gonski was announced. And everyone was talking about Gonski this and Gonski that. And we found that 80% of people, two weeks after this debate started, and it was all over the papers, had no idea what Gonski was. They knew that it had something to do with schools, but no idea what the content was. And I think go full, full circle to your point, Catherine, about content. Give me something to read. And I think when we all sort out how to fill that gap of giving people stuff that's actually relevant quickly and in an interesting way, that's the thing. And the, and the secret, I still think, is that one of the most read c content, which is both political, economic, and social, is the content that night and the morning after a budget. Mm. That's effectively our State of the Nation address. Yeah. What's going to happen to me? What's happening to the nation? Who said it? Why? All those things are melded. Now, if we can replicate that somehow in, for other content, then, then we do the, the system a tremendous favour. Mm. Michelle, would you like to add anything to this discussion about the media or confidence in the way uh, information Does anyone, does information anyone else feel sick? Tra <laughs> transmitted. <laughs> I, I, I actually, um, let me speak as a consumer as opposed to a pollster. By the way, the answer is 20% believe journalists have honesty and ethics. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what, what's politicians? <laughs> 16. Oh, right. Well, oh, that, that's a relief. What about used car salesmen? Yeah, they're marginally lower. <laughs> <laughs> and what about pollsters? I bet We're you higher, pollsters. 34%. <laughs> OK, no, seriously, seriously, I, I, I actually feel deeply distressed by all of this. Um, I'm thinking of the waste, the extraordinary waste that's going on with these games that are being played. Running a country is a really important thing. It's a very, very important thing. The people who are charged with running a country have a huge responsibility. And, and I would like to speak for most electors and say, I just want people to do their job. So I think that it's, it's really unproductive, the, the, the bickering and the level of disconnect that's being allowed to happen. And we can all talk about why it is so. We must look to the future and say, how can it be better? Honestly, running Roy Morgan, if every time I spoke, there were nattering people say, don't believe her, look at her dress, what's she wearing, why did she say that, she said that yesterday, blah, 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 we would get nowhere. And if my executives who then had to go and do the field work and do all of their jobs were being attacked right, left and centre, the company would implode. It would implode, I would say, within three days. And we somehow expect to run a country with this craziness. I think we all have to try and look to something a different, a better way. We do need to look for the things that need to be done. Whether there are problems with the NDIS or whether it's the right way to go, let's look at it and let's look at it constructively. And, and you know, I, 
I hadn't realised until I started to talk to politicians that they don't actually explore the NDIS, the implication for people, the implication for the country. They look at it first through their lens. What's it going to do for us? What's it going to do for us? How are we going to knock them about it? It's awful. It's just awful. So, you know, I don't know exactly how it should get done, but I have to say it must, we must actually change. And the timing is really hard. It's really hard to do stuff quickly. And, and I, you know, I can understand how hard it is if you've got to get stuff out all the time, no time to check it, then the embarrassment, you know, and I, I remember even as a young person talking to people on TV, and I'd say, hang on, I don't actually want to bring that poll out now because I'm not confident. What if we bring it out? And I remember talking to Gerald Stone, I said, what if we bring it out and actually we find out that it's not wrong? And he said, this is TV, the next night they won't remember Michelle. I was gutted because I actually believe that as a person purporting to give the views of the Australian people, I have this huge responsibility not to lie, not to use something that's too early that's not right. And I'd really like to hear the same kind of um, feeling from the gut from our politicians believing what they say, not just doing what they need to do to get to the next, um, you know, the next win or to get somebody out of politics. I think it's really important that we think like that. Now, about prime ministers changing, I feel, less I feel that's less important. I really do. If there's a new person running coals, do we all go, oh my God, what's going to happen in the supermarket? We don't. We actually believe that coals will continue to operate. We do trust that these things will continue to operate. It's, it's the, the outrageous situation that's, been, that's emerged where we're just kind of poking fun at each other all the time and arguing. Totally unproductive. Much better things that the country should be doing. All right. That's my view. And very forcefully put, quickly, across uh, the panel. Tony, what can I just make a, a, a sort of slight yeah, counterpoint sure. or, or a bit of context, maybe? Yes, it doesn't look great, and people are all over the place, wandering around, shaking their heads. Prime Ministers come and go day after day. Uh, Dennis Walter said on the radio today, one more Prime Minister before Christmas, you know, it's sort of just... <laughs> <laughs> so it goes. But if you look at how the country's performed over the last couple of decades, you know, this unbroken period of economic growth, high degree of social harmony, yeah. we resolved the marriage equality debate, all right, clunky process, but we resolved that. Uh, we live behind secure borders in terms of, you know, the possibility of external threats. I mean, there's a lot of good. Imagine how fantastic we'd be without all the noise. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think part of the problem with the noise is that we've become a different country in, in lots of ways, you know. Sydney and Melbourne, 40% of the population was born overseas. That's not what Queensland, WA and Tasmania look like. Uh, there are different issues, different stresses, different things that people have to deal with in different parts of the country. And the politicians will look at the polls and say, well, you know, am I going to survive in that, that environment? And, and how do I carve a place out? I'm going to ask Mark and, and Catherine this, uh, this next question. Uh, and, and, and Jeff used the phrase, high degree of social harmony. Uh, I'm just wondering whether that's consistent with the, sh the shrinking support for the major parties, the emergence of the fringe parties, uh, the, ha uh, the Pauline Hanson phenomenon. Uh, the system, in that sense, seems more fractured. And I, I wonder, I mean, uh, uh, it, it seems evident to me anyway that the two-party system is having a lot of difficulty maintaining its, its, its grip on things. But I, I, I just wonder what you think about that, Mark. You mean in terms of a solution or whether well, I think it's real? Well, just, just governing in, a, in an effective manner, you know, keeping uh, a mod modicum of control. Well, I think um, Jeff mentioned in a brief email exchange we had that Belgium managed to survive 500 days without a government, um, one of the things we have to consider is whether we are maturing as a nation, and I, I, I can't remember the exact data source, but you know, you can have trust in government, but if you don't have high expectations of government anymore, I don't mean in terms of honesty, just in terms of whether they're important in your life, because le less institutions than, say, 40 years ago are actually run by government. Government doesn't set interest rates anymore. Uh, 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 independent Tariffs. body does. Tariffs, uh, all those sorts of things. So, so government effectively 
has less to do with your life. The number one, number two, are expectations lower and do we just have a more mercenary attitude towards these things? Are we, are we more robust? That, that's an ongoing debate. I think that's a pregnant debate. I don't think there's an answer yet. Um, as to institutions, I'm naturally a conservative, not in a social sense, but in the sense of I think the best thing to do with an institution, speaking as an ex-economist, ex is to have a price signal. So effectively a vote signal. So in the system, people have to say, OK, I understand now if I keep electing this sort of party or this sort of politicians or uh, a group of people with this sort of view, I can self-correct and I can vote for someone else. I don't see that as a crisis in a system. I see that as a system correcting itself and, as Michelle says, the people having their voice, which at the end is what we have. And as Jeff says, we've had a relatively... We've had some really acrimonious debates in this country, um, but we, we have um, an extraordinarily... We have some very significant challenges, particularly in rural Aboriginal communities, and, and making sure we close this gap. But other than that, we've got some, some, some good things. And I, you know, the other thing I've noticed is this, is that and, uh, Paul Colgan of the Business Insider said this, and he was talking to a bunch of, I'm not quite sure that he spoke to Michelle as well, but after speaking to a bunch of pollsters privately, uh, and I don't, I don't mean pollsters like me, I mean public opinion people you who... You mean real pollsters. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, that people who bring the views of the public to, um, to, to, to the government or to companies were a lot less pessimistic than the journalists they were talking to. That is, the folk who are out there in the field talking to communities were, notwithstanding, like you've just learnt in rural communities, aware of yeah, some of the challenges, but optimistic about Australia's ability to adjust and, and, and respond. And that's been my experience as well. In the deepest of crisis, my view is, and I found this mostly with the gun debate, that, you know, I remember going to Cairns in the midst of that gun debate and a, and, a, and a guy talking about how he really valued his weapons and how he liked hunting and how he enjoyed his guns, but said, no, it's, it's the right thing to do after all, after all this pain. So that, that gave me a lot of, even back then, a lot of confidence in Australians' ability to, to be discerning and discriminating in the good sense of the word and make their own minds up. So I have a lot of... I have a lot of confidence about the future, to be honest. Catherine, I mean, you see this every day, sitting there in the parliamentary press gallery, mm -hmm. uh, and have been, as you, as, as you said, or as you were introduced into the, uh, there since uh, 1996. I mean, is the system, the rivets popping? <laughs> um, you know, uh, is it not falling apart, but fracturing? I mean, do you, do you, do you get a sense that, uh, you know, the, um, that the, 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 the pieces are not fitting together like they used to and that we're entering a, a sort of uncertain period? Yeah, we're certainly in an uncertain period and a complex period. Um, and uh, there is a shift away from the major parties and part of the reason for that is there is this enduring paradox in uh, Australian politics over the last sort of decade or so that the major parties in the Australian political system used to be the ramparts in the system. They used to be about providing stability. That used to be their premium. And uh, through the, the coup culture, the rise of the coup culture, they, they've diminished their own currency. They are projecting to the public now regularly uh, that, that they are not the, the signpost of stability that they once were. I, th I think that was sort of that may have reached its zenith in the Wentworth by-election when the Liberals sort of catch cry for re-election or Dave Sharma's catch cry, poor bugger, um, to be elected in that seat was stability after... I mean, it's, it is just profoundly ludicrous. And so people are, are thinking about alternatives. Um, that doesn't distress me a bit like Mark. I think, you know, a, com a competitive political system is a good system if... It is the age of disruptors. If people are rising uh, on the political landscape to offer something different, then I'm not scared about that. The, 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 I, I confess that the, the parliament I've found the most interesting of any parliament that I've covered in my time in, in the parliamentary press gallery was the 43rd. The minority parliament uh, was the most fascinating parliament for me by a country mile.
uh, and it had a, a set of different dynamics to uh, a non-minority parliament. But it's, it is, uh, while I agree absolutely with, um, with, with Jeff and with Mark about uh, the, we can sort of wring our hands about the Australian system, uh, but we, we are, you know, w would you like to live in America at the moment? I wouldn't. I, I would not. And I would not like to be charged with the responsibility of covering this particular president. Um, you know, would you like to be in the UK, sort of convulsing through Brexit? Would you like to be in Europe with the rise of reactionary populism? Uh, and the sort of undercurrent of authoritarianism that's creeping back into European politics? I wouldn't. I'm very glad to be in Australia, and by comparison, we are a beacon of stability. With that said, though, um, the major parties, I think, do need to grapple with this, this, this issue that um, they, are, they are supposed to be the, 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 you know, the sort of buttressing of the Australian political system and yet culture in both parties has not lived up to that imperative. Uh, and uh, I disagree a bit with Michelle, I think, in terms of the changing of prime ministers. I don't think it is like Coles. I really don't. Uh, I think this, uh, having, I have been in Canberra, I have followed every one of these since Malcolm Turnbull got rid of Brandon Nelson. I've been through the entire cycle of this. I've done every one of them. And each one gets worse. Each one has a more profound traumatic effect on the group of parliamentarians who live through it. And, you know, like anyone with post-traumatic stress, it has ongoing consequences and it kicks through the political system. And I don't know how you stop that, but I think the person or the political party with the guts and the moral clarity and the fortitude to stop it will go some way to restoring a bit of stability, a bit of confidence, a bit of, dare we say, mindfulness in the Australian political system. That's uh, you take it from with, the with a bit of data. <laughs> with, with a bit of data. With a bit of data. This is fascinating from the Australian Electoral Study. Maybe we're getting used to leadership changes. Look, approval of the Rudd, the Gillard replacing Rudd event uh, from the Australian Election Study, which is one of the, large, the largest post-election studies out there. 25% for that one at what, the time. Approve the change. Approve the change, yeah, which is not a lot. Uh, second one, there's a lot of them, sorry. Um, Rudd uh, replace Gillard, or re-replaced or redo, was 42. Uh, and Turnbull replace Abbott was 48. Now that's a pretty strong upward trend. I don't know whether it continued or well, not. Well, that's. For, I don't know whether that's actual approval or Oh, well. throwing their hands oh Mark, again. you're just throwing numbers at us now. <laughs> no, 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 no that's from the audience. No, but there's, well, we, we yeah. should. But there, there's another data point, though, that, like, every... In terms of our essential poll, I got them to pull the numbers, actually, just on every leadership change. Every one of them has been a positive bounce in 2PP of two, three points immediately, mm. except this one. Mm. Now, there are a lot Sorry, of... Sorry, Tony, points. I just want to... Yes, sure. As the old guy, I just want to make a couple of quick points, which is... You know, the way Malcolm Fraser got the leadership, the way Andrew Peacock got it back, these were not pleasant, no, no, agreed of course. transactions. They're all and Shakespearean, aren't they? Yeah, and True. the parliament, when they decided to, question, uh, to televise question time, and obviously everyone was, God, what's been going on in Canberra? You should have been there in the 70s when one of the Labor members tried to climb out of his seat to go and physically assault one of the... The Liberals, you know, I mean, <laughs> it wasn't a, a gentleman and, 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 you know, ladies club, it was a, a rough and tumble place. And I can tell you, having lived and worked through a number of leadership challenges, nothing the parliamentary press gallery likes more than a leadership, <laughs> and, and, as, and, and, and as much blood on the floor <laughs> as possible. Now, we've come to uh, the 7.30 hour, and it's time for questions. I, I'm having trouble seeing people in the audience, but if you could put your hand up and... Uh, um, there's one right down the and, right here. Uh, oh, two. And uh, maybe there's a microphone over here so people can actually ask, a, ask oh, questions. Oh, no. <laughs> and I, I mean, we usually do this at a pre at, at, in a press conference. Identify yourself, possibly, if that's reasonable. Um, I'm Gary Morgan. I hope you know me. Um, 
28 years ago, I gave a paper at the National Press Club, the last time I was invited there. Now there's democracy in Russia, Australia must be next. Nothing's changed. So I suggest you go to the website and read it. And when you read that, you'll see there's no change 28 years. Now, I've got to ask a question of, uh, of Catherine, and I think I've conducted more public opinion polls than anyone else in the world. I'm certain I have. So I think I'm entitled to ask the question about what have you done about correcting the error that on what you published in the uh, Guardian, the Reach Till <laughs> poll commissioned by Greenpeace, and it was out by, on Tim Murray, it was out by 10, uh, 10%, it was out on uh, Karen Phillips by 3%, it was out on the Liberal Party by um, 11%, now, is this public opinion polling or PR propaganda put out in The Guardian? The well, answer is there was no, no, no sample, no, there was no uh, way in which it was conducted, but the whole of the media followed your poll until, of course, the Liberal Party brought out their private polling. No sample, no, no description of how it was done. Of course, Mark Texter will tell you it was done correctly. The answer is, how did you correct that error? How did you tell your readers about the error that you made? End of question. Okay. Um, uh, I don't myself, Gary, think I did a Greenpeace poll. I'll, I'll I said you published the Greenpeace poll. No, 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 no I'm, not, I'm, not taking, I'm not disputing what you're saying. It's just that it's, it's, I'm not familiar with the exact poll that you're talking about. This is a Wentworth poll, is it? Yes. yes. Right, OK. Uh, I did uh, myself report on a poll that the Refugee Council commissioned. Uh, and I think there was one other interest group. No, you missed my point completely. No, 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 I haven't. Accuracy of polls. Yeah, yeah. This I poll is brought out and yes. it's so inaccurate, it's a joke, yes. and it makes a mockery of public opinion polls, yes. which my family has made a wonderful profession of and has done accurate polls for now over 75 years. Uh, Five. Yes. We've got the message. No, no and, I, and I, I didn't miss your point, Gary, but rather like you, I have a bit of a preamble to, uh, before I answer your question. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, I, I don't know if, if it was widely out, I mean, I have an issue with single seat polls. Uh, and there's an issue that we didn't actually discuss at all on the panel, which is a completely legitimate issue about the rise of activist groups commissioning polls mm -hmm. in order to uh, massage public opinion in various ways. And a lot of those activist commission polls have push-poll questions that elicit certain responses from, from voters. And uh, I obviously can't account for the Greenpeace poll because I didn't report it. Uh, every single seat poll that I report, I always say in every story that I have ever written using a single seat poll, because I'm quite leery about them, I have a line in every story that I write, news story, uh, that says single seat opinion polls can be unreliable. Right? So that's my way as a journalist telling, telling my audience, buyer beware with this material. If the, if the poll, like people bring us single seat polls all the time, interest groups of various types. Some of them we don't run at all because they look, they, they look so dodgy, so off, that there's no way that I would even, that we would this report it with. This one probably should have gone in that category. In yeah, well, well I, I'm at a disadvantage because I didn't yeah. see it and I don't know it. I don't know, I don't know what it said. I accept, what, I accept your, your account of it. Uh, in terms of what we've done to correct readers or, 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 or tell readers that the poll didn't say what we, or, or, or that the, sorry, what am I trying to say? That, that, that it didn't reflect, it, that it wasn't an accurate reflection of public opinion or the result in the Wentworth by-election, well, I don't think we have corrected it because it, what we, what we, <laughs> we report a poll, we, we apply our own, I don't know, I presume the reporter was Anne Davies because it would have been either me or Anne. Um, you know, I don't know if Anne put a disclaimer on it before she published it. I don't know. Yeah. Next question, down Car here in the Carly front row. Carly Earle, she's a photographer. It can't have been her, I'm sorry. Anyway, I'll, I'll look it up, Gary. Continue the debate. Sorry. <laughs> question here. Yeah, Hi. identify yourself, please. Hi, I'm Alexander. Um, 
uh, citizen. <laughs> uh, Welcome. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, <laughs> so, so um, I wish to ask a question. Um, there's an institution in the United States called Brightline Watch, which is an organization grouped together of academics, political scientists, who are studying and commenting on what they see is the incredibly dangerous sequence of norm erosion in the American political system. The, the, the fact that certain, certain uh, behavior of politicians that would have previously been taboo, previously been unthinkable, is now thinkable and is now being acted upon. Um, so my question is, do you think there's a reason why we ought not have a similar organization in Australia to monitor the behavior of politicians and the, to comment on um, certain norms in our political system which might be weakening due to, of course, the great disruption that's occurring to our political system. Um, if I may just give a, a particular example. Yeah, quickly. Yeah. Sure. Um, in, in Victoria, we've had a case of um, in our state parliament, the pairing of, um, of parliamentarians for a vote, um, that norm um, violated by the opposition. Um, this was a norm that hasn't been violated in 100 years, and yet this has happened. So my question is whether with hyper-polarization perhaps in our political system, whether uh, political actors will be violating norms or violating more norms, and whether we have reason for concern for this in our country, given that it's happening in many other countries. Sure. Yeah, no. Does anyone want to respond to that question? Um, can, can I just say, um, it may just be more noise. That would be my concern. Any group that looks at these things may just be drowned out by the general cacophony about things. But then the other thing is, what, what would be a norm? I mean, Daniel Andrews marching with the unions, I would have thought was kind of breaking a norm that everyone looked at. So I'm, I'm not sure that having a group of academics that point out what almost seem like technical details is going to make a huge difference. Perhaps I don't understand the point. No, no, yeah. I mean, that's a, that was a particular, yeah. Yeah, very specific example. But I mean, there are certain norms within our political system, like or certain features of our political system, which we think that both sides more or less agree on, more or less agree on um, independent judiciary um, and other other features. Um, but then there are other features which we also think maybe there is some kind of contention, but we still think are fundamental to our political system. For instance, compulsory voting, an independent AEC, an independent. Um, uh, public broadcaster, mm. and there you see a bit of tension. And it's interesting uh, yeah. to see. I think what we'd all say is that the uh, the media plays the role of a gatekeeper in the in these cases, uh, you know, and points out when conventions are being broken and so forth. And I, I think in the, in this country, I think we're fortunate. Of course, I'm prejudiced, but I think we're well served by an independent media. Next question. Sorry, right here. In the front. Thank you. Um, my name's John. I'm citizen two. Um, right. Look, much has been said and written about our two-party preferred system of voting in Australia, and, and um, many have argued that it really strikes at the ideal of sort of universal suffrage, which of course is the cornerstone of our representative democracy. Um, does the panel think, given the topic tonight, that it's time Australia moved to a system of proportional voting? Can I just... Good question. Um, Jeff. People have mentioned the UK is going through its own political sort of crisis or, you know, debate. Uh, and the distinguished philosopher A.C. Grayling wrote a book, Democracy and Its Crisis, and one of the, his solutions to the problems there was to introduce compulsory voting. So, you know, it, it's got benefits, it's also got downsides, uh, all those voting systems do. I think what it's delivered for us probably means it's best left alone. I think it's, uh, you know, the, ch the culture will change that would it uh, come with, uh, with moving to a different electoral system would be uh, another layer of uncertainty and, and, uh, and mystery. Seems to work okay in New Zealand at the moment, does it? Mm. Oh, they've got an extraordinarily complex system. It was it's basically designed so that no one can get a majority. 
uh, was the system the Americans brought into Germany after the Second World War. <laughs> and uh, I've been there during an election, and <laughs> it's a strange one. Well, I'd only say that the earlier point that was made about understanding the system you're voting for, putting aside the merits of the change, you're going to have a period where the price signal's not quite clear, you know, how you vote, what happens. I'll give an example of that. Um, in New Zealand, the MMP system was basically brought in regarding concerns because they didn't have two-party but first-past-the-post systems based on electorates, uh, that there was very large swings uh, between governments. So governments would have an enormous majority, you know, like Piggy Muldoon had. And, and so the theory was that it would empower voters more with a multi-member proportional system, where effectively the Senate part of the House, which is in one house, adjusts the relative importance of the electorate seats by adjusting the list ticket. Um, and I go on and forever about it. But an unintended conse consequence of that is government is decided after the election, not by voters, or only indirectly. So a government with a certain number of votes, um, so in the last election, a Labor Party government got a clear percentage less, by, clear percentage less than the city government, and say, fine, they'd do a deal with you know, other centre-left parties, but ended up going in coalition with the New Zealand National Party, less led by Winston Peters, who arguably, who you know, arguably ran one of the, you know, a, a, a immigration campaign that would put um, uh, Corey Bernardi to shame. So you've got to be very careful changing systems because the electorate mightn't be used to w the way it works. And even a small change, uh, like, the, like the, the change in the ballot in the Senate paper, mm. even that has had enormous mm. consequences in Australia. Yeah, it has. Uh, when you think about what's happened to the Senate. So, you know, there's always a temptation when the game's not working properly to change the rules of the game. I agree with Jeff is you, you've got to make sure the referees are doing their, their job, you know. Uh, and if you look at the great, uh, Michelle, Michelle quite saliently and correctly mentioned the contribution of the banks in relation to the, the lack of trust as well as the church institutions. When you look at that, it's interesting that one of, to the point about the AEC uh, that Jeff mentioned and the banks that Michelle mentioned, that one of the greatest um, uh, criticisms of the way that's happened is the lack of, not the lack of laws, mm. but the lack of policing of those laws by APRA, by ASIC, mm. and, and uh, I think there's one other. There's probably the Reserve Bank. So, so I think it's, it's a system-wide reform that you're looking for in that let's police what we have better um, and let's make sure that the system is operating as efficiently as possible. If there's a democratic gap, let's, fi let's fix that. If there's, a, if there's a reputational gap, let's fix that. And if, there, if there's a regulatory gap, let's fix that. I can't uh, believe I agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we go to the next week, personally, I'd like to see four-year fixed terms. But of course, people in the, in the uh, political journalism business like more elections. I think we right? should have an election every year. <laughs> <laughs> every five minutes. <laughs> next question. <laughs> Yeah, I'm uh, Joe, and excuse my voice, I'm just coming from a cold. Oh, right. um, but I'm interested in um, exploring the definition of democracy. It, it seems to me that we haven't really got a definition of democracy. We don't necessarily have an agreed framework for it. And it just seems to me that um, we should be focusing much more on that question uh, about what we mean as Australians by democracy. What is democracy in Australia? Wow. Well, who would like to tackle that one? At eight o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have well, a... I, thought that, I think that's a really, it really is, interesting it? question. Um, and it gets to Michelle's point about bringing the voice to the people. Do we live in a repo republic or do we live in a democracy that gives us a republic? 
that is traditionally um, we'd vote for someone every three or four years and say, fuck off and do your job, right? Um, and now you get the chance to say fuck off every day through your polls. So the definition of democracy is changing because of the disruption and the reporting of the nature of our democracy. That is, everything's measured these days. Um, you know, what people think of the NDIS, what they think of Gonski, what do they think of the economy? Is it up or down today? Um, just the way that we're obsessed with it. I remember seeing a CEO similar to the ones you used to work for, and the CEO was sitting there with his spectacled glasses and his fancy suit on and goes, Tex, you know, those politicians, they're all short term. All they do is about the polls, bloody polls. And I said, you know what I saw coming up your bloody lift this morning, mate? Everyone obsessing about your share price. <laughs> Owly! <laughs> Now, it's all right for you to get pissed off to America in three years' time, and you talk about the short term of the politicians. So I think we've got to keep this in perspective. Yeah, and just bouncing off that point about compulsory voting, if you talk to people in countries with voluntary voting and tell them we've got a compulsory voting system, they say, well, that's mad, that's not democratic. Forcing people to vote, they should have a choice not to vote. So the, the definition of what the elements of a democracy are, you know, it's a broad, it's a broad road. Good question. Mm. Do you have a, anyone else want to make a contribution? Next, next question. Um, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a Year 11 politics student, and um, I have a question. Um, it's back to when you guys were talking about the distrust in our system, and um, do you think that a reason why there may be a drop in trust in our government is because um, we're exposed to information firsthand without parties being able to shape the information? Hmm. Who wants to deal with that? I'll have a go at that. Why don't you do that, Catherine? Um, you think that people are... Their trust has declined because they get more primary information before politicians shape it for you. Why... Just... Can we get a mic back to Sarah? Why do you think that, love? <laughs> just, just expand a little bit. Um, God, I'm all nervous, sorry. Um... <laughs> Um, I guess um, in class earlier this year, mm -hmm. we were talking a lot about it and like how the 24 hour news cycle has sort of shaped, I guess, the media that we receive and yeah. that how a lot of times um, politicians like to sort of, I guess, leak a story to mm -hmm. um, media. I don't know if you're. Oh, uh, I see. So it's sort denied, of. But it, yeah. It's, it's, it's multifactorial, right? You, you, you're saying that. People can go and get information for themselves re rather than relying on the politicians' yeah. version of it. Yeah, that's what I mean. And and they and uh, and citizens are sort of discounting what they read in the media because it all seems manipulated. Yeah, exactly. Right, is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I meant. Uh, well, that's sort of at the core of it, isn't it? Um, you know, there's uh, th that's we have we have got this disruption in how people receive and get information, and uh, we do have as a consequence of community perceptions about political journalism being too close to the protagonists, right, that it's all one complex rather than an oppositional relationship, uh, then, um, you know, the, everyone sort of applies a massive bullshit factor, right, to, Actually, to every, on that, everything that they're consuming. Michelle published, Gary and Michelle published this um, media usage study last year. It was a cracker. Um, about the change in media usage for news services. Have you got that? It's a bloody great. Um, just talking about... Well, moving the to social media, that people are using more... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you add the data. It's, 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 um, go to the Roy Morgan website. You'll see um, uh, media habits for news services. It's quite interesting. And it backs up Murph's point about content delivery, basically. Mm. Um, I kind of have a, a, a somewhat divergent view in that it's a good thing that people can get if they're so inclined. You're obviously having just answered a tough question from one of Australia's toughest journalists from year 11. Um, it's a good question. But there's a, there's a downside to that, that yes, you can gr get some stuff that is independently delivered to you from various sources, you know, um, Polly watch or you know fact check or whatever it may be I'm not quite sure who you use but you can equally someone of your age could get another 
uh, piece of information, of which there's even more, I'd say, even more than these independent sources. Uh, that is uh, from the perspective of the political party. And rather being filtered by wise heads like Tony and Catherine, um, and Jeff in his day, there, it's unfiltered. Uh, that is, you might get, you know, um, I was having a look, I'm, I'm passionate about battling anti-vaxxers, you know, because it is actually a great human <coughs> achievement getting rid of a thing called polio. Uh, when you have a look at, at, at the way anti-vaxxers are getting mm. their information, it's straight through Facebook groups and they just talk to themselves all day and send each other the most unbelievable, unscientific drivel you have, you have ever read in your life. It's staggering that people believe this stuff. And the, and the availability of these forums or these channels to deliver this information is unheard of without any control. So put it from a, forget the politics. Think of politicians as a government. If you're a politician now saying 5% of the people or whatever the percentage is, is adversely harming potentially 95% of children through not access, accessing vaccines, it's very hard to get to that 5% because they're not going to government or the Sydney Morning Herald or the Guardian or the Oz. They're just going straight to the anti-vax Facebook site and reading In all this. In their own bubble, <laughs> yeah. round and round. Yeah. yeah, talk about the Canberra bubble. Man, there's some crazy-ass mothers in there. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you can I just add uh, one more yeah, thing? Yeah, sure, can, I, sure. can I go back? Um, Sarah, I think it's, it's a really good question. And I, I speak to my daughters about this and they sort of say, Mum, we don't believe all of that stuff. And I think there, there is so much fact and fiction being thrust out that people of your age and thinking people are actually being um, shown how to try and challenge everything that you read. At least that's what my kids tell me. They're a bit older than you. And, and I think that's both wonderful but also for you quite daunting because at the same time you're sort of going, well, I can't believe anything. But I think the reality is this is the world that we live in. And, you know, people are better educated today than ever before. Very few people um, go through in Australia and leave before they've finished year 12 or whatever. So you have to learn how to find your way through this stuff. And you, you kind of, that's part of living, I think. And it may be part of the reason why people distrust, whether it's government or banks or sport or the church or anything like that, I really think the real reason for distrust is we've had a series of, you know, full disclosures about really terrible things that were going on. And, you know, whichever way you look, they really were happening. And we're kind of gutted to think that it was going on. But I think you'll have to find your way through the dross for some time into the future. And that'll be a real life skill. Catherine, did you want to... Only uh, just quickly. Only just quickly. Obviously, I think it's great, love, if you can get primary source information. And as a reporter, I make a practice of linking readers to it, right? I think that's actually a boon about the current environment. I agree totally with what these guys are saying, though. It's sort of like it's a little bit of a case of beware of what you wish for, right? Um, it's sort of... Um, audiences are very frustrated with journalists at a lot of levels for uh, applying a filter, right? And they argue with us about where we, where we set that filter and how we determine it and, and, uh, and are we working for audiences or are we ciphers for politicians and all of that stuff, like, bring it on. I love that debate. It's an important debate, right? But if... Um, I think it's a balance. I think uh, citizens need access to primary information, need to know that it's there, need to know that they can go and interrogate it on their own terms and make their own judgments about it. But also critical to what I do is to try and be an information broker. It's sort of like, I said to a young bloke in my office recently that it's sort of like, think of yourself, you like in the financial markets, you're a trader of information. And what you need to do is get complicated information, process it quickly, Tell people what you, in your professional judgment, believe is important for them to know and tell them. And that's a service that we provide to an audience. And I think it's an important one because if you find journalists you trust and mastheads you trust, 
It saves you a lot of time in your day. You can trust their, their judgments are, in all of the circumstances, reasonable. You can trust that what you're reading in an age where kids your age get news from Facebook and not from mastheads. You guys are totally post-mastheads. A lot of young people I talk to have got no idea about The Guardian but have read everything I've written. So, you know, you're in a different consumption pattern, right, to what I was when I was your age. But it is, both of the things are valid, right? I don't think you need to go from one extreme to another. Both of the things are valid. You can't trust all, you can't trust all journalists, you can't trust all mastheads. You know, good journalists make mistakes. Um, you need to be able to have your own sense of inquiry and have your own access to the content. But don't write us off because we're here to help. <laughs> now, Catherine makes a very good point, and trust is fundamental. And establishing trust with your audience um, is absolutely critical. And uh, you know, if I can make an observation about Catherine, I, I, when I read what she's written, and I do critically, as I have for many years, uh, <laughs> you know, I know that she's done her homework. I mean, she has a particular viewpoint, I guess, and and uh, you know, um, you you take that into account. But you know, I. I always feel that she's done, you know, she's, she's actually made a few phone calls, <laughs> which is more than some. Walsh, do, do you have a view no. about that? Another question? Hi, my name's Darren, um, and as it happens, I'm not uh, a citizen, um, but in the three years that I've been here, I've been profoundly fascinated, bordering on horrified um, at some of the things I've seen. And on trust, uh, you mentioned earlier on, Mark, that um, Malcolm Turnbull and the role of the Prime Ministership was an elephant in the room. I would actually say there's a bloody herd of elephants in the room with things like uh, uh, energy policy um, and climate change. Um, the whole marriage debate, it's technically not over yet because there's the Religious Freedoms Report, which is still not out. We don't know what's in that. Um, um, where do you go from there, uh, uh, I mean, w w with the politicians, and how do you have trust in them? Uh, 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 how does that right itself when you have a situation last week, which for me is worse than anything I've seen so far, w where the entire Senate, um, or the government in the Senate, sat down and voted on something that they were just told to vote on without actually... No, I mean, that they just were not thinking on their feet, and I, I found that more disturbing than anything. And then on the media side with trust, um, when you've got Peter Dutton coming out and saying that the ABC and The Guardian are dead to him, mm. how does that make you feel? Um, <laughs> you've, you've, got, you've got, was it Andrew Farr and the ACTs coming uh, last year, early on in the year, coming out saying that, um, you know, he was finished with the media, he hated them all, and now you've got the Tasmanian parliament um, barring um, journalists from walking the halls and having chance encounters with the, the local politicians. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bit mad, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Good question. Mm. How, yeah. how, how, how do you get over that? Yeah, well, terrific question. I could, I could address both. Um, yeah, the thing that disconcerts me the most about the political system at the moment is that, uh, that, the, that uh, the level of issues we are not addressing properly that we need to uh, is outweighing the number of issues we are addressing. And it disturbs, that disturbs me a lot because in Australia, in our political system, we have been very, very good at uh, facing up to the challenges of economic transformation, uh, dealing with big social questions. Uh, we, we have been very good at that. And I think institutionally we're becoming less good at that. And that's a whole, that would take me three hours for me to tell you why that's the case, but there's a definite diminution in the, in the capacity of our system to do that well. And that really does concern and frustrate me. And if you read my journalism, you'll know how frustrated I am with that. Um, in terms of uh, the media, well, it, it, yeah, it's tough. Like, it's tough at a, at a lot of levels, being a journalist at this point in history, at this moment in time. Um, and uh, all we can do really is keep showing up, <laughs> keep Tony, doing the job. Yeah. Maybe it's a little note of optimism. Uh, the Labor Party, through that difficult period with Kevin, Julia, Kevin, uh, relations turned pretty 
unpleasant. And I think as well as recruiting a generation of, of new people into the, into the parliament, which Labor, I think, has done very well, I think Catherine would agree this new, mm. new crop are really good people, but they've also decided they don't want a repeat of that. So some of it's, you know, actually fixing itself. Uh, whether it'll end up fixing everything, I don't, I don't think. But at least there are good things happening that probably aren't, uh, aren't being uh, noticed. And, and on that front, because obviously we've been, we've been fairly depressing tonight, really, in our outlook, although with a bit of intermittent sunshine, um, but uh, as, as kind of battered as the whole joint is and, uh, and as full of despair that I feel on occasions, uh, I mean, climate change and the whole debate about Nauru at the moment is really weighing on me, really weighing on me. Um, as depressed as I feel, um, I'm also, if I can give you the audience this note, of confidence or reassurance, um, there are fantastic people on all sides of the political divide in politics who are there for the right reasons and who try and who double down and do the work. Uh, I know those people. I deal with them all the time. Um, they remember that as well when you look at it. Uh, and it's in part when I ask myself whether I want to keep doing this, whether it's actually whether, whether I make any difference at all and whether it's worth the opportunity cost associated with doing it. I feel a debt of obligation to the people in the political system whom I know well, uh, who are there to change the country, and I owe them. So remember that. Remember that. Do you, do you two, Mark, do you want to add at all to that? What, what cats are I like, or, I like or, Jeff's um, sense Michelle? of perspective. I'll tell you a little story. You remember Levinson? You know, when the Levinson inquiry and... I well, do. Yeah, <laughs> when, when a whole bunch of media were, were wiretapping, um, I don't think that's a phrase, but phone tapping politicians and Hugh Grant, um, <laughs> a floppy-haired fellow, and... Um, you're jealous, aren't you? Yeah, totally jealous. <laughs> and, but, but, but this was, I think Tony would agree, the most unprecedented thing, a, a series of media reports I've ever seen. Every day for f a month solid. Page one, page two, page three. Whether it's a left-leaning broadsheet, whether it was a, a tabloid, uh, whether it was a regional paper, whether it was the Brighton Science. This, this was extraordinary uh, in, in, in British politics. And I remember uh, running a focus group, uh, which we bring 10 or so people into a room, talk about matters of importance to their lives, and then probe on particular issues using a structured moderator's guide. And so I was really worried because it was, I think, the early stages of, um, of Boris Johnson's, who we, whose campaign, both his campaigns we ran as London Lord Mayor. I was out in one of the outer suburbs, I think Bexley or somewhere. And I thought, how are we going to run this group? You know, we're totally saturated with this, this cynicism about media, um, you know, about the political systems destroying itself. You know, we had chiefs of staff resigning. We've had newspaper editors falling on themselves. We had one of the Murdochs mm -hmm. resigning, mm -hmm. didn't we, halfway through? It was, I mean, it was a big deal. Um, anyway, we're, I'm, I'm running this focus. Now, what, what sort of things have happened this week? You know, with people talking about moving their kids to school and uh, grocery bills and, you know, I think the soccer teams. And I'm there 10 minutes in thinking, God, when are they going to mention Levinson? <laughs> 20 minutes in, when are they going to mention Levinson? <laughs> so you really haven't got to the point here, people, tonight. So what is the big issue? I'm, I'm a bit frustrated. As you can see, I'm from Australia. I want to know what the real issues are. And they all said in unison, bloody gas prices. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Michelle, do you want to add at all? Um, look, the only we're, thing... We, we're getting the wind-up here okay. too, by the way. OK, um, can, I, can I just make a call out for respect? I think one of the really critical things, and, and you made me think about it, um, Catherine, is that our, our politicians actually need respect to operate. And I think there are probably some really wonderful people who would not go into politics because 
Who would? It would be really tough. You know, it would be such, you'd have to have such a thick skin. It, it's a hugely responsible job, but if only we could actually respect our politicians, respect the system, and get on with the job. That would be wonderful. Um, Michelle used the word need. I would use the word earn, respect. Uh, but uh, Catherine prompted this, uh, this, this thought in my mind. As a young reporter in Canberra, uh, and, and very different days then in the uh, early to mid-70s, um, I used to go occasionally and have a scotch with uh, Jim Killen. Uh, he'd had a few scotches by then, I have to say, uh, uh, late, late in the evening. And, I would just, and he said one thing to me which has stuck in my mind ever since as a young reporter. Just remember one thing, Tony, not all the best bowlers are on the same side. And I think that's, you know, it's important to remember that. Mm. Now, I think that's it, mm. is it not? <laughs> um, I don't know whether I'm Nick is going to give a vote of thanks or if he's still here, but perhaps <laughs> I... I think we'll he's take gone. One more <laughs> very, <laughs> very strong. Our own recognizance. Oh, well, we, can, we can take one more question, one more. yeah. So he said um, a lot of the stuff you're talking about was going to get quite depressing or buckle up. Um, You've spoken plenty about the political factors influencing influence of the sad democracy in Australia, but you haven't at all delved into the major issues that are causing them. Uh, or, the, or what is causing the lack of faith in your institutions. So we have, we've had $17 million by lobbyists funded into Australian politics over the last decade. We've seen rotation of politicians from public service into lobbying groups for corporate interest. We've seen an age of, of corporatism that's, that's resembled a runaway neoliberalism that's left us at the mercy of a so-called free market and has led us to environmental destruction. We have geriatrics leading our country who won't bear the economic or e existential consequences of global ecological collapse. We've seen huge biodiversity loss, we, uh, anthropological induced mass extinction. We've seen the loss of the biggest living structure on Earth. And the question. Sorry. Oh, it's That's getting the there. I just need to give yeah, you some yeah, pretext. Uh, yeah. <laughs> The UN states in the most recent report that we have 12 years to avoid climate catastrophe and Australia has taken next to no action on climate change. Do you have a question? I do. Well, uh, let's hear it. Yeah. Okay. Do you agree that we are going to need an entire cultural and spiritual transformation of the entire Australian psyche to meet the challenges of the future? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> We're going to see decimation of jobs in the next 20 or 30 years from the yeah. rise of artificial intelligence. Yeah, that's right. Mm. We, need a, we, need a, we need a political system capable of looking over the horizon, understanding what the challenges are, uh, setting a pathway to adapting and meeting those challenges, uh, doing that in a uniquely Australian way, and by... Yeah, no, look, I, I think did. we've got the point. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got the message. Yeah. No, I, I, no, I mean, what, what you're saying is, I understand, I understand where you're coming from, uh, and we do have myriad problems. Hot yes, yeah, yeah, the, yes, this is, uh, and this is good. You've got the fire in the belly. This is great. <laughs> um, you know, it's... Of we need we need a system that functions. We need a system, uh, and what, when, I, when I say we need uh, to address problems in our uniquely Australian fashion, the reason why we are not America, the reason why we are Australia, is that we've had a balance between government intervention, redistribution, uh, you know, to ensure that our inequality levels look nothing like the levels in America. The I think the conversation on this matter might continue outside the, the uh, hall. Well, listen, you guys. Mark Texter was crutching sheep this morning in Crookwell, which is north of Goulburn. Michelle Levine was running a complicated business. Catherine Murphy's writing columns, catching Bye planes and managing a bureau. Uh, and Jeff Walsh has uh, uh, torn himself away from the golf course on, uh, on the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, uh, thank what you. What were you doing, Tony? I, uh, <laughs> uh, 
That's a good question. I was, <laughs> I was, I was fretting about this event. Um, <laughs> but listen, thanks very much, all of you, for your contributions, and uh, I'd like to all to show your appreciation. Thank you.